experiences right now. So give me just a second. All right. I think I'm live on both uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Okay. I'm going to set myself up here so I can see everybody and the camera so that it's, if you see me looking in a weird direction, it's probably because I'm looking at the other camera. Anyways, we have a live Q and A and I thought I was going to have to fill this with my topics, but we have so many questions that got submitted that this is going to be great. Nice and easy. Okay. Does that seem to be better? Is that better? No, I don't think it's only you. I, I think this should work. Just let me know immediately if you can hear me. Okay. So we'll keep going. And let me just reiterate this question because I think nobody heard it on our YouTube and Facebook platforms. So I apologize to my Instagram audience for listening to this again. So the question that was submitted is for me to discuss my recent post about lightening up for big voices. Um, and I posted something that said lightening up the potential death um, sentence for a big voice. Now, I do want to clarify this because I do think that there's a little bit of misunderstanding. And for those of you who have followed my material, you'll see that I do talk a lot about lightening up and light registration. So you might have been a little thrown off when I posted that. Um, but so this deserves a lot of clarification. And this person also asked, how do you know if you have a big voice also? Okay, so this lightening up idea, when you're dealing with an instrument that is big, first, let's define what a big voice is, okay? A big voice doesn't mean that you're singing Wagner or um, you know Puccini or Verdi only. A big voice could mean that you're younger, and you are singing Mozart and you're singing Donizetti or Rossini. But at this point in your development, your instrument hasn't reached its full potential. OK, and this is, I think, where a lot of people find themselves. Um, I think it's probably, you know, I'm not going to say it's rare, but some voices that are big are big from the start. And you know it. You What you see is what you get and you know what you're dealing with. But a lot of voices are hidden under compensations and constrictions that to say that some some voice is not a big voice early on before all of these technical hurdles have been overcome and worked through it's sometimes impossible to say so you'll have a voice that 
might be very well suited at the moment for things like Mozart or bel canto, but then you'll notice as you start to explore with the instrument that it's actually a little bit constricted. And I think this is what I want to talk about now, because when you're dealing with a voice that hasn't reached its potential yet, and how do you know that? Well, I think part of it is exploring. We have to constantly explore as teachers and as singers. If we're not consistently exploring and finding the edges of what our voice will do, we sometimes are backtracking. Okay, so it's really up to the teachers and also to the singers themselves to be responsible for trailblazing their own vocal discovery. So what can happen in the process is we're sorting through compensations, okay? We notice that our tongues are retracting, maybe our neck muscles are becoming engaged when we're singing. And yet, maybe sometimes the singing sounds pretty good for a short amount of time, but then maybe things start to happen and the person says, the singer says, I don't have the same way of singing. I can't sing the same way that I used to. And I don't know why something's not working. And a lot of times in these cases, and this is what I want to just separate in your mind, that it's not just about a big voice, like we're dealing with somebody who sings Wagner, not necessarily, but it could be that the instrument really wasn't explored to its fullest potential. And so now they're experiencing the constriction that was there all along, but they just can't handle it anymore in the vocal mechanism. And so at this point, this lightening up idea is very detrimental because you need to learn to relax the larynx. You have to learn to allow the correct laryngeal tilt. You have to learn to get the full chord closure while engaging the laryngeal tilt over the full compass of your range. And most people don't achieve this in their lifetime. Okay. It, it's true. And I'm talking even at the top levels, you're not hearing this. This is not something that is, you know, consistently there. And I do think that it doesn't mean you can't make a very beautiful sound. So this isn't a value judgment on the sound or the artistry. This is just a simple statement of physical um, ergonomics. Okay. So if you are telling a voice that is having balance issues to lighten up, what often happens is the first, it, unless the person really understands registration and not using compensatory musculature, probably to deliver that aesthetic, they're going to engage more compensatory musculature. They're going to squeeze harder. The larynx is going to pull further up. And so you're actually creating a situation that works in reverse from what you really want is relaxation and um, engagement of the correct muscles. So that's why this idea of lightening up can be dangerous. Now, if the person has a really solid understanding of the light mechanism and can actively employ the light mechanism without constriction, then this is good, okay? And that's why it's important for bigger voices for us to make sure that we're teaching the light mechanism in a manageable range for that voice type and that they can do that at several different dynamic levels because light mechanism does not mean soft singing. So when you have somebody that comes in and they have a very big voice and it's full of chest pull in the sound, okay, you don't want to immediately make them lighten up because they don't know how to do that yet. So what you'll probably have to do is start on a lot of SOVT work, a lot of light humming exercises. I know I just said light, but in a manageable range for that voice. Okay. So if the, the person comes in and they can't do anything about the C5, then that's where you start. So um, that's what I would say in terms of that. Now, in terms of how do you know you have a big voice? Well, I say if the nature of your instrument tends to have a lot of chest pull in the sound, and you can remember back from when you were first studying that that was kind of the nature of your instrument, that's a good sign that your ability to um, maintain a TA action higher in your range is probably pretty easy for you. And if that's the case, I'm not going to say you're a Wagner singer. That's not what I'm saying. But 
if you can do that pretty easily, I know for myself, I was able to position my vocal apparatus in such a way that I was essentially belting high C's at the age of 16. They weren't pretty, believe me, nobody wants to hear them, but I could do it and it felt easy. Okay. And this was a sign my teacher, my fantastic, fantastic high school teacher at the time really understood this. And so she knew I was a spinto soprano, even at that young age. And she trained me accordingly. Um, and that was very, very helpful. And my range grew so much from work with her and the beauty of my instrument increased. And I wish I had kept on that path. Anyway, so that's a good sign that you have bigger voice. If you feel that the voice has never really been able to settle technically. Now, again, please understand the definition of a big voice doesn't mean you're singing Wagner. It just means you might be a bigger voice than you think you are. So if you have not been able to get yourself together technically, it could mean that you're not exploring the fullness of your instrument. So that's another consideration to really think about. Um, okay, I, I realize I'm a little overwhelmed at all the comments. Let me just stop and look. Okay, hold on. Um, yes, I'd say that happened to me. Yes, how would you define the spinto soprano? I'll get to that in a second. Can you talk about airflow versus air pressure and how can we avoid too much pressure? Yes, Gabe, I will get to that a little bit later on. Okay. First, how would I define a spinto soprano? I think that's a soprano that's pretty full um, and is able to pull in a significant amount of thyroarytenoid muscle or chest action into their top without it causing problems to the instrument. Um, that's spinto means like push. Okay, so that it's a full lyric soprano that has moments of extreme drama. So that's how I would define the spinto soprano. Okay. Next question. Um, actually, let me just quickly answer yours, Gabe, because this is going to tie into a couple of other questions that have been asked. Okay, so this is about airflow versus air pressure, and how can we avoid too much air pressure? Yes. So airflow is air that is flowing through the cords, okay? The pressure is what's happening underneath the cord. So the air is building up pressure depending on how closed our cords are, that all relates to the pressure system. So just think about it like a building, okay? Um, th there's a, you know, in COVID times, we don't have a ton of people in, in a small building, but imagine you had like a hundred people in a small room. If you have one tiny little door, it's going to take longer for the people to come out, okay? And there's more pressure, if you think about people like building up kind of like air, there's more pressure building up in the room because they can't exit as much um, is as easily as they would if the door was bigger. So that's the idea of air pressure is that the closure of that cord is not allowing the air to just rush out. Now, if our door is bigger, the people can rush out and that's less congestion back in the room. So therefore less air pressure in our analogy. So how can we avoid too much pressure? That is a balance of our respiratory muscles. Respiratory muscle training is important, um, but also understanding sensations and understanding um, that if we're singing with a high larynx without laryngeal tilt, we can be pressurizing too much when we learn to tilt the larynx against the force of the airflow, we'll be able to manage that pressure system a lot better. Okay. This is a side question. Did you do the tongue tie surgery you spoke about a few months ago? Yes. Um, Sanjeev, I did. And I have a ton of videos on that. So I won't be addressing that so much today, but I have a whole section. If you look on my channel called tongue tie release, I did it in January, life-changing, ran a fantastic um, program this summer for singers who also did the tongue tie procedure. So yes, I have a lot of information about that. And that's one of the mainstays of my um, vocal technique, uh, I guess, ideas, okay, that I'm that I'm trying to speak to. Okay, number two, high note strategies for mezzo-sopranos. And I want to tie this in with another question that I have for mezzos to deal with their passaggio around D and E flat five. Okay, so let's talk both about those. So really there's not a different strategy for mezzo-soprano uh, as opposed to soprano, but the challenge can be that the mezzo-soprano 
the aesthetic of the voice type lends itself to perhaps more thyroritinoid action, more chest in the sound that can lead to an imbalance as you're approaching the top. Some of it is learning to learning to hear yourself in the correct way and assuming you are a mezzo soprano, okay? Because there are people also that fuck themselves down because they have trouble with high notes. So assuming that's not the case, all right? Assuming you really are a mezzo soprano and you're having difficulty, I think it's about reframing your listening to yourself, your the way that you auditorily process your own sound and to start to trust that the fullness of the middle voice is there without having to add extra TA action into the sound. This is really important. And I think for mezzos, it presents a much bigger challenge. You're typically singing in a lower tessitura, um, especially if you're not singing, you know, the lyric mezzo rep, if you're singing more dramatic mezzo rep. So something you really want to pay attention to is registration, specifically around A4, um, B flat 4, B4. Okay, that area you're going to want to make sure you're lightening the registration significantly as you go into that second passaggio because that's going to dictate whether or not the top is easier. Now, um, that passaggio can be difficult because if you really don't have the right balance, the vibrato pattern can get irregular. The breath, it, as we just were talking about, our breath um, pressure underneath won't be stable. So we'll have this situation where the larynx is doesn't know to fully tilt and maybe comes out of the tilt and it's being pushed up by too much air pressure. So if we take the pin out of any one of those points, so there's various ways to fix it. You can fix it from a laryngeal position. You can fix it from a phonation or a registration perspective. And you can fix it from a breath pressure perspective. So any of one of those things that you alter will give the person a different sensation of the voice in that area. And that can help to um, understand that a little bit. Okay. And, and then to go along with the same question, it's why the vibro might be hard to navigate um, at the beginning of practice some days. So that again, really plays into the breath support. So you should be doing at the beginning of every day, I would take that entrance to the upper passaggio. So again, the A4, B flat four, um, B4, that area. And I would start doing light voice humming on it. Five, four, three, two, one pattern. Feeling your rib cage out, steadying the vibrato vibrato pattern so that there's no but so that you feel that smoothness on the air and what that can help you do is sensate your air pressure system to the laryngeal tilt and the phonation and the registration of the voice so you can manage all of those things without adding open mouth singing on this you can also use a straw i have this i found this thing the other day You can use that. Just make sure that you're not allowing that excessive vibrato. And I'll tell you why, because that destabilizes the laryngeal mechanism. So when you're allowing the vibrato to come in, look. You see that this is actually moving up and down, okay? We don't want that. We don't want the larynx to become unstable. So. As opposed to. And I think you can hear it and you can probably see it on my neck when that's destabilizing. Okay, going to your questions, let's see. Does the Spinto Soprano put the chest up to C5 natural and with ease or after she has some good training? I managed to put my chest up to B flat four, but I am still not fully trained. The most Okay, I'm assuming you're talking about C6 and B flat five. Uh, but but I know that the pitches are called different things in different countries, but I assert, I assume you mean high C, okay? Now, with that, I, I do think 
that a lot of voices who are naturally spinto or, um, or dramatic have the ability to bring the chest up quite high early on. It probably doesn't sound good. It probably sounds like they're straining, choking, um, but no, not high C. Okay, you do mean C5, natural. So Gabriella, I'm actually talking about high, high C, okay? So I would say that a lot of um, dramatic voices have the ability to bring the chest up, especially in that upper passaggio pretty easily. So um, that can be trained in for sure. Chest connection is really important. And that was kind of the point of my post from the other day as well. So it that is that can be something that is trained in, especially if that's not part of your vocal makeup from, a, from an educational standpoint. You know, we all speak different languages. And so we have different and also different cultures. So different ways of communicating in the voice. I live here in Slovakia. And I noticed that the speaking pattern, it's its usually much higher. There's a much higher speaking pattern here as opposed to us in America that kind of speak down here. So I do think that there's different ways of um, our, our, vo our voices developing depending on the language we speak and the culture that we're in. So that plays a lot into how our muscles are trained even before we start actual formal voice training. Okay. Now we're going to go to how to make a light sound with a big space inside and finding the head voice for tenors. Okay, first of all, we're going to talk about this, how to make a light sound with a big space inside, because guess what? This also answers our question before about that the mezzos asked, okay, about their high notes. And we were talking about the entrance to the passaggio. You'll notice there's a theme today, like everything connects to everything. So if you have a question, you may want to watch the whole thing because it's probably going to be answered in different ways. So how to make a light sound with a big space inside. Two important components. The larynx must tilt, okay? And then we must learn to engage the full cord, but use as light as possible a stroke for the pitch level that we're at. This takes training. This takes perception and real understanding. And so trial and error, a lot of trial and error. Error. Okay, so what is a laryngeal tilt? So if I sing a pitch like this, oh, that's got not a lot of laryngeal tilt in it. Oh, okay. What we do to change that sound is the front, the thyroid cartilage tilts down and forward, okay, and that's the CT muscle, the cricothyroid muscle is engaging and tilting that cartilage down so the cords can stretch more fully. So listen to the difference in the sound. Versus. So you can feel that. And this is what people are talking about when they talk about the yawn position, okay? The yawn position is very helpful to find, but you have to make sure you're doing it with the tongue up in the back and that you're not accidentally pressing down the tongue. So some people will yawn, oh, oh, and they'll pull down the tongue. That's exactly what you don't want to do. So when you're practicing this yawn position, oh, oh, with the tongue floating up, if your tongue doesn't want to do that very easily, there are um, there's a lot of retraining and exercises that you can do to start to retrain that reflex in yourself. Um, we're not going to go into that today because that's, that's there's a lot of information there. Okay. Um, but so, so when we make that light sound, if we're in that laryngeal tilt, oh, 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 you notice that suddenly the sound takes on a velvety, more gentle quality. Oh, oh. So we can actually make a softer sound, okay, softer in texture. And from that soft texture, the dy dynamic is less important, okay, because that's going to depend on your voice size and where you're singing, right? If you're singing in an opera house and it's really big, you can't be quite as soft, but the timbre is going to be soft and gentle. Oh, that's that chiaroscuro, right? It's a, that perfect balance. It doesn't, it doesn't hit you too sharply, but it also um, isn't too dull, right? So really finding that yawn space while the tongue is up, that's essential. So you're finding the bite of the voice 
ah, 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 with the yawn. Ooh, 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 ooh. And you're putting them together. Ooh. Okay. Um, and, you know, and so then the second part of this question is finding head voice for tenors. So I don't care if you're a tenor, a baritone, a bass, whatever voice type you are that is not mezzo or soprano or countertenor, because countertenors probably, I'm assuming, have natural access to their falsetto production. But if you're a tenor, baritone, bass, bass, baritone, you need to be practicing in your falsetto register. You have to get that thin chord mechanism working quite easily. So it's the same for tenors. I would start in a range that is pretty easy for you, maybe around a C4, okay? And then I would practice really with the straw disengaging as light as possible. So you don't give a fully supported oh, that kind of sound, but oh, that kind of sound. And when you're practicing that, you can allow a little bit of airflow in because that's not the last stop on the train, right? If you allow that airflow in to the sound, you will depressurize the laryngeal system and you'll find that release that that head voice and or falsetto needs. I do use that term um, interchangeably. I know some people don't. I use the falsetto and head voice interchangeably because I do think that the mix, which sometimes we refer to as head voice um, for tenors, but that's a misnomer a little bit because we do have these two functions of the voice, the falsetto function and the chest voice function that all voices, no matter uh, your voice type, that they, they operate in, right? And then we also do have whistle register um, or super falsetto register. So, though, so that's what I would say about finding the the head voice for tenors and that you keep moving that up the scale and when you feel that there's constriction go to that yawny oh, oh, that really hooty place ooh, 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 so that it's not oh 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 you know tenors are sometimes quick to want to put a point on the sound try to take away the point so that you can find the lighter access and then once you've found the lighter axis, then you'll be able to find the balance. But don't try to balance before you have any access to that falsetto mechanism, okay? And if you do have easy falsetto production and you're looking to balance that into a mix, into the head voice, that's going to take probably a little bit of patience on your part in terms of navigating that passaggio. And so really that laryngeal tilt that we were just talking about earlier, that becomes exceedingly important to understand and to work with. Okay, next question. Oh, look, it's it's like a variation on the theme. Laryngeal position and how much to open the mouth. Okay, so we were just talking about laryngeal position. Now, I wanna say one more thing about laryngeal position. If we think about the larynx, okay, the, the moving cartilages of the larynx, so we've got the thyroid cartilage that is tilting this way, right? Now, we're not trying to move down this way. We're moving down like a tilt, okay? So what you don't wanna be doing is pushing down with your tongue to make space this way, straight down. You want that larynx to feel like it's floating, okay? Conversely, you don't want the larynx to be pushed up either. So I would say neutral larynx in terms of the full position of where it is in the neck, but the laryngeal tilt gives it that quality that sounds like a low larynx, okay? Um, if you want clarity on that, just let me know. Now, how much to open the mouth? I think it's really important that singers learn to train with their mouth open, and I will tell you why. A lot of times we're compensating in the jaw when we're not fully opening. And it doesn't mean you have to sing with the jaw fully open. What it means is that you need to learn how to sing with the jaw fully open to be certain that you're not accidentally compensating by closing, gripping, tying the tongue up with the jaw, which is very common. So if you practice on an open ah, mama, 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 you should be able to do that with an open mouth. If you feel like you can't get clear phonation with your mouth open, there is a constriction somewhere. So you will want to work that out in your lessons. You will want to do exercises for that. And it's not the most painless process. In fact, a lot of people who are learning to undo compensations and learning to open their mouths will notice that 
they've never been on their breath before. They'll notice, oh my goodness, I suddenly I feel like I have to work a lot harder in my body. And that is totally normal. So undoing this compensation and opening the jaw in your training oh, 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 can really reveal a lot about what you've been hiding, um, not purposefully, but what's been kind of held in your voice and where the breath hasn't been working fully. Okay, next question. Favorite way to stay firm and or get a good cord closure without pressure in the upper middle? Okay, so again, this goes in with our laryngeal tilt idea. So when we're tilting our larynx, we're less likely to pressurize in the wrong way. I'm not saying it can't be done because there's always us creative singers out there that can cause uh, tensions in even the ideal sit setups. So, but if the larynx is tilted, oh, 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 there's less likely that we're going to pressurize. So if we have a tendency to pressurize that area of the voice, the upper middle, then I would start with that loose phonation first to find the laryngeal position. Everything in the voice, every single aspect, in fact, when I think about it, is about this tug of war, okay, or a balance of opposites, the yin, the yang, okay, chaos and order, tug of war between our 12th graders and our kindergartners, my favorite example. I feel like we did that in, um, in school. I don't know. Anyways, so when we're looking to find that low laryngeal tilt, what can happen is if we try to bring firm cord closure right away, we might cause a jam up in the system and we might not be able to find that low laryngeal tilt. So we start with the tilt, looser phonation, okay? Oh, oh, oh. And then from that position, oh, oh, you can start to play around. I'm doing a low voice to kind of imitate my upper middle for a baritone. It probably needs to be lower. But what you can do is you can start to add a little bit more core in the sound but only when you, if you feel the larynx change position or you feel the timbre change drastically, then that's when you know you've gone too far. And so you may have to work that out over a series of weeks to really find that balance. E is a good vowel or anything that gets the tongue up. It, depending on where you are in the range, E may not be a good vowel, but you can use any vowel, A, E, 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 any vowel that gets the back of the tongue up because that will prevent the tongue from pushing down and forcing the cords to pressurize, okay? So um, to stay firm and get good cord closure without pressing in the upper middle. Yeah, you can do, let's see, because I, I, I know who asked this question. So what I would do is something like an eh. Uh, notice I didn't want to push my belt up there, but that upper note can be a little bit tricky. So I'm trying to mimic the baritone range right now. Now, if I were to do that again, did you notice that that note was a little bit fuzzy at the top? So I would do that again. And I would lean into the tilt just a little bit more. Now, mine kind of cracked there, okay? But you notice that the chords now were a little bit more closed when I did that. So let me show you again. So you, I really was finding that place and I could feel when I wanted to let go and maybe a little, make a little adjustment. So you wanna go slow and you wanna find those points. You also wanna make sure you're hydrated. It's not wine, it's just sparkling water, but it's pretty, right? So that's why I drink it out of this. Um, so you wanna make sure that you really are exploring each little sensation as you're going in that area so that you don't miss the opportunity to keep those chords closed. Cause I think you could probably feel it. I know who asked the question and they're a fantastic singer. So I know that they'll be able to feel that little bit of difference. Um, but any vowel that gets the back of the tongue up and the larynx tilted low 
is going to help in that. And I would do ascending and then descending thirds. Um, okay. Tips on finding resonance. Hmm. That's such a loaded question. I'm going to answer that because I, I really don't have a reference point because I actually don't know the person that asked this, but I'm going to answer this on just uh, if we're talking about the ideal resonance in a normal kind of middle range for a singer, okay, for a classical singer. So you want the middle of the voice to have a nice point on it and yet have sufficient roundness and sufficient darkness to be able to go up in the scale without causing tension, okay? And you also want to have the access to go down and still carry. So finding resonance, if you think about two aspects, two animals, let's talk about two animals. Okay, this is my favorite. So we have our cow. And if you've ever heard a cow mooing, like really up close, it kind of sounds something like this. Mm, mm, okay, so you can imagine like this low, deep mm, kind of sound. And then we have something like the best example is like a pterodactyl. Now we don't know what they sound like because we none of us were around. If you were around, let me know. I'd love to talk to you. But we've seen enough movies and have speculation on what a pterodactyl might sound like. So it's like that ah kind of sound. So if we combine that feeling or, or that oral perception of the pterodactyl with the cow, mm, ah, mm, ah, oh, right? We have something that kind of is a balance between those two. So you need to know yourself. You need to know where you fall on the spectrum, okay? If we want to be here in the middle, but your voice tends to be really, ooh, you're going to need to do more exercises to go more meh, right? And if your voice tends to be more meh, then you need to do more exercises that are mm in nature, right? So that's how to balance that resonance and recording yourself is really important, okay? When the voice is right, you are going to probably sense it as being less beautiful inside your head than it actually is out there. Um, if it feels really dark and woofy to you, probably it's not carrying and um, resonating quite as much as you would want on the outside. So that's just something to check. Okay, we have a question here. The role of the pharynx in relationship to larynx and general vocal production. I'm gonna get to that one later because I think I can tie that in with another question. Okay, actually we can probably tie that in with this. So let's go ahead on. Tips on finding, like I said, everything's connected. So the role of the pharynx in relationship to the larynx. Okay, so the role of the pharynx is that it changes shape. It changes shape according to our pitch level. Um, this is a bit of a landmine, so I'm going to do my best. But I know who's asking the question. She's a soprano, okay? And so when we have the pharynx, our, our soft palate, right? All the way back there. Okay, it's shaped in such a way it doesn't stay static over our range. Yes, we want it to be raised, but it can't stay there and just hold on consistently. We have to allow it to kind of be like a jellyfish. Okay, it changes form as we move through our range. And that's for every voice type, doesn't matter what. But in terms of the specific discussion that I'm about to say, this is a little bit different because it depends on your pitch level. So for a soprano, as we're ascending through that second passaggio and up, the palate is going to start to dome in the center and the sides of the palate are going to do this, okay? They're not constricting, they're the palate's doming so the sides come in like this, okay? So to, in, to try to hold the throat open uh, in like that kind of position as you're going up, <clears throat> it can be very tricky for sopranos. So you don't want to fight your pharynx. And, and another thing, this is not definitive. This is not fact, but this is something I've observed. In general, you want your embouchure on the outside to correlate with your soft palate shape on the inside. For example, 
if your soft palette needs to be like this for the top, your mouth should not be like this. Okay. It should really be. Now it can be open, but it can't be wide. Ah, ah, ah. Ah. It's different than ah. Oh, they're not the same thing. So make sure you're really looking because when we're talking about the voice, a millimeter of change changes everything. So if you just look at a picture of me and go, ah, uh, the difference between this and uh may not seem like a lot. It may not seem like a lot to you, but it can mean the world of difference for your high note. Okay, so really go and explore those minute changes that might make a big difference. Okay, our next question. Techniques for um, vocal recovery after losing it with a sinus infection. Okay, again, my new favorite contraption, straw vocalization, <laughs> buzzing, okay, in a mid range. The one thing I do wanna say, about after being sick, especially if you've had cord swelling and or you lost your voice, laryngitis, we can want to protect our voices. And this happened to me actually after I got sick uh, about a month ago. I was like, I don't want to sing too hard. I don't want to sing too heavy. So I was protecting my voice a little bit. And my teacher was like, okay, what are you doing? Like, you need to actually sing into there, sing. Okay. And I was like, that's a good reminder because we do have that psychological urge to protect something that's been injured, right? So I would say, just make sure you're allowing your voice to really sing. And if you're stressed about pushing it, then don't go high. Find that fullness of your voice, but in the middle range when you're coming back to singing after being sick so that you can find that full release. And again, some larynx work workouts are good for that. So if you find you could do a yawny exercise like, something really yawny because that'll help open up this area where it might have gotten a little constricted and pressed up when after you've been sick okay next question how to retain soft palate lift on descending lines good question okay i posted this reel the other day if you have a really hard time managing this yourself, I would say you try it a few times or maybe even a couple weeks with your thumb on your palate. So you're going to take your thumb and there's your palate. You're going to stick it all the way up. If you're not used to doing this, you might gag. That's okay. Just be near the bathroom. You'll get over it. Okay. And you're going to find that point on the palate and push up. Then let's sing our descending line. Now, what you'll notice is you can't press down, but did any of you feel that you could feel your palate pushing down onto your thumb? If you can feel that little impulse or that little spasm, that tells you that your palate has a reflex to drop and push down as you're on the descending line. So all you have to do is vocalize like that for a couple of weeks get used to that sensation. So take your descending lines and practice with your thumb on your palate so you can get used to that sensation both orally and physically. And then you should be able to do that. So if you do that for a couple of weeks, then I would try it without the thumb. See if you're able to maintain that. You can also try plugging your nose. Um, that's not as That's not as foolproof. I really like this mechanistic version. Um, but if you really can't abide, you know, make sure you wash your hands. But if you can't abide your thumb all the way in the back of your throat, then you can do with your nose plugged. Okay. And that will help keep the palate up on descending lines. Okay. Next question. Do you engage the pelvic floor muscles in singing? And if so, is this in the inhalation phase? Okay. Yes you do engage the pelvic floor muscles in singing. Um, I think this is probably something I take for granted a little bit, but I recognize that this is something people, some people don't have access to immediately, okay? And I think the first step in understanding the pelvic floor musculature is getting acquainted with the sensations and what that feels like. Um, 
because oftentimes we're walking around and we're tense and we're trying to get things done and we're not allowing our muscles to release. Now, I have a tendency, believe it or not, for my pelvic floor muscles to be always in the release position. They're not in the contracted position and engaged this way. So it depends on who you're working with because different people have different ways that their body reacts. So for me, I, it helps me to employ my pelvic floor when I'm kind of at the end of my breath and I need to have a little extra support. So that helps me. But in terms of the release on the inhalation, those floor muscles need to release. So when you breathe in, you should feel that release all the way through the pelvic floor. So it expands, it expands out and down. Then when you're singing, I would say don't engage the pelvic floor right away or not a lot, okay? You want to reserve that for kind of the end of the breath phrase. So it can be there. It can be ready and like active, but it's not fully engaging right at the beginning of the exhalation singing process. Okay. How do you maintain cord closure? We had we did have that question, but I'm going to address this slightly different way now because this one was asking about the other question was asking good cord closure in the upper middle. And this is just how do you maintain cord closure? Okay. Again, this can be something you have trouble with or some people this is you have the opposite problem. I had the opposite problem. I was always in press phonation. Um, so that was something very difficult for me. But a lot of people do have trouble maintaining that cord closure. E vowels are really good for that. Um, where is my little, okay. I usually have my chopstick here, but I don't have it right now. A really good exercise. This is my pencil and it's dirty. So if I get sick, I'm going to blame everybody. Just kidding. Okay. So a really good exercise for cord closure is to bite a pencil or a chopstick. And you're gonna say E, okay? You're gonna do E. Now you wanna keep the lips and everything and the face muscles lifted away from the chopstick. E. You also wanna keep a yawny sensation in the throat that it's oh, 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 kind of that yawny position, not E. Okay, because the cords can close like that, but that's really not our aesthetic. So you want to combine that. It may feel like you're kind of talking like this. That's totally okay. Um, so practice this. Now, if you go fully into the tilt and you can't maintain the cord closure, that's okay. Go as far as you can. So even if it's... You might have some... Um, people that are rebalancing their voice, and it might sound like that right at first. That's totally fine. Go where you can manage the that chord contact and that you don't hear something like this. Okay, I mean, you get the idea. Probably it won't be that extreme if you hear it, but if you hear even a little bit of that air leakage, go bring down your dynamic level get that firm cord closure as best as you can. Then if you get that position, you can start tilting the larynx. And you're going to be most efficient when you do tilt the larynx. So if you're in an untilted position, even if the cord closure is good, it's still not quite as complete, okay? Because if you think about the full vocal tract, the arytenoids can completely close. So the whole glottis is closed when we're able to fully stretch that cord and you have enough room to do that. So you do wanna work on, the, on that laryngeal tilt. Okay, next question. Breath support and head resonance exercises. Ooh, okay. Breath support, those are two different things. So let's talk first about our breath support exercises. Well, as you know, okay, I've got this fantastic device. This is the breather voice made by PN Medical, okay? And this is actually a respiratory training device that helps you 
build up the correct musculature in your body for, uh, well, this one's for singing. Okay. But this company also produces these for normal humans who don't sing, who are bringing their respiratory system back from either an illness or from other, some other kind of malady. Yes. The breather is great for developing breath support. Um, I'm assuming that's what you mean when you ask the support question. Now, the other exercise that I like to do is really finding this, um, anything from an M to a vowel is going to help you find this relationship of support without pushing the larynx. And this will play into our head voice, wait, what head, head resonance exercises. Head resonance, I'm assuming you mean head voice, okay? So when you're doing that hum, you're keeping the voice in this kind of like unpressed position. Then when you transition to any vowel, say it's May, you want to keep the position of the voice and the direction of the voice in the same position that you had the M. So you don't want out. Do you see how that went that way? You want going back. Okay. So that hum can really be a great protective mechanism to make sure that you're not pushing out on vowels. That's why I love any exercise that incorporates that M. But now if we're talking about head resonance exercises, okay. Anything with ooh. I love, love ooh. So let's say you get a voice that is very thick and rigid and just cannot access the head voice. Start somewhere around the middle and try to get them to form a really good ooh vowel, which depending on the country that you're in, I'm sorry if you, for my Americans, Americans are not well versed in forming a good ooh vowel. So we do have to be taught. Ooh has to be formed with the back of the tongue up, ooh, ooh, not ooh, ooh. Usually Americans tend to drop the tongue like ooh. You want ooh, ooh. So you almost feel if you're able to contact your teeth, the tongue, you'll feel it on your teeth. Ooh. And from that position, you can do kazoo feeling like you're stretching the vocal tract very tall very narrow and feel that the voice is coming from this third eye point okay when you do this you don't want to feel that the voice is coming from here This is going to give you that sensation that we really are looking for when we're talking about head voice. Okay, so start somewhere in the easy range and you can keep taking that higher. Um, and this ooh exercise, actually, you can take very high, but as you get up into whistle register, it might start turning into. Okay, but you can still achieve that with that same exercise. Okay, now let's see. Oh, yes. I wanted to add on to this last question. Okay. So this is why, why vibrato might be harder to navigate in the beginning of practice some days. This comes down to airflow. This is because oftentimes we're, you know, especially if we're above the age of maybe 23, 24, our musculature needs to be aligned. All right. And even if we're younger too, okay. Even when you're younger, if you're not in alignment, sometimes it takes a little bit to get that positioning. So spending the time to make sure your registers are really seamless. And what I like about the straw, I'm going to take it out of the water for a second, because you're going to hear something very important. If you slide through your register, Okay, mine didn't do it because I've been singing all day. Let me try to make it happen. You'll notice the first thing when you wake up and you're doing this, 
there, I did it. Okay, so you can hear that there's an audible kind of crack or release at some point in the voice when you deal with the straw. And that's where you want to kind of work to sort of iron that out and feel that. So what I would do with the straw is those little places that are kind of grainy or gritty are and you just keep passing over them think about ironing when you get a shirt and it's wrinkly you pass over once sometimes the wrinkle's still there pass over it a couple times okay and gradually you're able to make that nice and smooth so the same thing when working out your registration at the beginning of the day you want to go over that and find that balance then once you find that balance, you'll be in a better position to navigate that um, breath pressure that we were talking about at the beginning of today, okay? Because our breath pressure management is really related to vibrato. If we push a little bit more than we should, we can cause the larynx to kind of con constrict or cause the vocal cords to constrict. We can cause any number of compensations to happen when we push, and that can create an irregular irregular vibrato pattern. So I would say in the beginning of vocalizing to do something in that upper middle as you're approaching that um, upper passaggio and make sure that you find that position where there's no vibrato. And I don't mean straight tone. I don't mean like, ah, but I mean the sense of, oh. Now, some people will say, well, that has vibrato. Yes but I'm not letting it go. Oh, that's something that you want to pay attention to really carefully, that you're vocalizing in a way. Oh, so you find that position that doesn't do this, okay? And that's going to help you regulate your breath pressure and not push by accident and really get to know your body and also get to know what's happening here. When you slow everything down and calm everything down, you can really notice these changes in pressure. You can notice changes in muscular action. Um, I feel like I'm going to kind of close this up because we're getting to the top of the hour. But something I do want to say to everybody, we have so much to cover and I had to like cram it all in in an hour. There were lots of questions, fantastic questions, everybody. But I do want to say something in general. A lot of these questions that were asked are, yes, sometimes about understanding. In fact, a lot of times about understanding. But after the understanding of the concept, you have to become your own detective. And in order to do that, you have to slow yourself down to the point that you're not worried about hitting the note. You're not worried about singing well. You're only worried about finding answers and noticing little variances in how you sensate things or how you hear things, because it's only when you are able to distinguish between those tiny little differences that you're going to have real control over your voice. I find that there is not enough awareness of what's happening in one's own voice and one's own body. And I think that that is due to this pressure, like we got to get it done, we got to sound good, get it out there, and that we don't slow ourselves down enough and start to notice all of these little things. Because like I said before, we have to balance every single aspect of singing. And so as I posted, lightening up and in that you know controversial post that I wrote about big voices shouldn't lighten up. Well, that's not actually true. Big voices have to be taught to lighten up but in a very specific way and in a way that they can manage step by step by step, every single voice has to be balanced, no matter what, every single voice. But the process and how you create that balance is very individual and really has to be done with not just a teacher, but has to be done with yourself. And you have to not just hand over your autonomy and say, okay, I trust you. I, and, and I'm just going to follow blindly. Yes, it's good to find somebody you trust. My goodness, the, you know, I would not be here without my wonderful mentors. And I'm sure you all have wonderful mentors as well. We need them. 
but we also need ourselves and we cannot give over our own agency and our own powers of an analysis over what's happening to our voices. So if you can really start slowing this down, don't assume you don't know. That's another thing. You actually might know. I mean, sometimes we don't know, okay? But don't assume you don't know. And to really take the time to explore your own body and the way that your voice behaves in ideal situations and in not ideal situations. Okay. So that's what I'd love to leave you with today. And I'd love to thank you for joining me either now or on the replay. And I look forward to doing another one of these very soon. Thank you for all these fantastic questions. I filled like two pages of questions and thank you for writing in. And if you have questions, please feel free to message me or comment here and I will see you next time. I'm going to try to end both of the live streams at the same time. Okay, ready? Bye, everybody.